Well, now invite you to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 15, which will be our, our sermon text for this evening. John chapter 15, uh, verses 12 through 17. And this passage comes in the context of Jesus' uh, upper room discourse. And you'll notice that in the first half of uh, chapter 15, Jesus describes his relationship to his people with the imagery of a vine and the branches. That we are the branches and Jesus is the vine. This is uh, referencing our union with Christ. And fruitful lives only come when we, the branches, are attached to the vine. Well, in our passage today, Jesus continues to illustrate this, what our relationship with, uh, with him looks like. But this time he uses the imagery of friendship. So let's now turn our attention uh, to the reading of God's holy and inspired word. So again, John chapter 15, verses 12 uh, through 17. Jesus says this, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends, for all that I've heard from my father I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. Well, thus ends the, the reading of God's holy inspired word. May he write his word upon our hearts this evening. Well, if I were to ask you, what is one of the most important things in your life? One of, the, one of those things that will lead to overall good health, emotionally, psychologically, even physically? Well, you may be thinking of a number of things right now, but I would imagine the top of most of our list would be friendship, relationships. And especially now, uh, I think we're thankful for relationships and friendships as we've been in quarantine for the last five or six weeks. I think we've recognized that we are, by nature, social creatures. We need to be around other people. It's good for us. It's good for our health. We will notice that our text this morning is speaking about friendship with Jesus. And a friendship with other humans is crucial to us having either a low quality of life or high quality of life, of us having good physical health or not. How much more is it important that we are friends with, with Jesus, the Lord of the universe? But when Jesus in our text speaks of friendship with himself, he's not referring to the benefits that I've just been mentioning good psychological, emotional, or even physical health. Rather, friendship with Jesus is crucial to our spiritual health. And our spiritual health is far more important than all of these previous benefits, all these previous um, uh, things that I've mentioned. Because it's our spiritual health that has consequences not only in this life, but ultimately in the life to come. Thus, as you can see, it's very important that we understand what friendship with Jesus actually is is. And this is precisely what we'll be doing this evening. So the goal of this, this sermon is really just to consider and ponder for a few moments what it means to be a friend of Jesus. And we'll do this in three main ways. We'll first consider the foundation of this friendship. Then we'll consider the privilege of this friendship. And then the lifestyle or the calling of this friendship. So first, the, friend, the foundation of, of friendship uh, with Jesus. Well, when you think of your own earthly friendships or relationships, I think we all recognize that there's a certain amount of pressure upon us to be liked. I think this is especially apparent when we are moving into new contexts, new, uh, maybe we're, you're moving to a new neighborhood, you have a new job, a new school. You want to be liked. You want to have friends. And as a consequence, we feel a certain amount of pressure to uh, present ourselves in such a way that people will like us. 
Well, this is not at all the case with our relationship or friendship with Christ. We do not have to clean ourselves up before we can enter into this this friendship or relationship. We do not have to make ourselves worthy of uh, this friendship in any way. Look with me at verse 16. In verse 16, Jesus says to his disciples and consequently to us, You did not choose me, but I chose you. Jesus is telling us that friendship with himself is not based on our own initiative or choosing. That he has selected us without anything in us being worthy of that love or that friendship. In fact, in Ephesians 1, uh, the chapter that uh, we were reciting just earlier uh, t- uh, this evening, Paul says that we've been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Before we had uh, done anything good or bad. The great reformer uh, Martin Luther, as he was coming to his uh, Protestant convictions, he once made the statement um, describing the difference between divine love and human love. And the way he illustrated this difference is he said that divine love is by nature creative, while human love recognizes. Uh, What he meant by this is that divine love creates that which is worthy of that love. So divine love uh, sets his love upon something that is unworthy. It's not worthy of that love whatsoever. But yet that love makes that object attractive and worthy of that love. It's creative. But human love recognizes beauty, recognizes virtue. And then we choose to set our love upon something. I think this is true in most of our relationships, whether it's marriage or uh, think of your best friend. It's not as if you chose to marry whoever you married because there's nothing in them that's worthy of love. There's no desirable quality in them. No, you saw something in them that attracted you to them, and so you chose to set your love upon them. That's human love. Well, God's love is completely different. It's creative. It sets his love upon unworthy objects and then creates something attractive. And this is what Jesus is telling us here. He did not, we did not choose him. He chose us while we were yet unworthy. We had nothing in us that deserved this love, but yet he made us creatures that are then attractive to him. So you can see the foundation, the beginning of this this friendship is is gracious. You may wonder, how, how has Jesus manifested this love? Well, he died for us, and this is exactly what he tells us in our passage. If you look with me in verses 13 through 14, Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. Jesus is surely looking forward to his, uh, or alluding to his upcoming death on the cross, where Jesus will literally die for his friends, his people. This idea of true friends being willing to, to die for another, the height of friendship, the height of love is, is dying, self-sacrifice. This is something I think we all are familiar with, even those who have never read the Bible before. And this idea of, of dying for your friend is something we probably all uh, would say we, we would be willing to do for our spouse or, or another close friend. But most of us, thankfully, are never put in that situation where we have to choose, where we actually have to lay down our life in order to save our closest friends. So you may wonder, what is it about this relationship, this friendship with Jesus that necessitates death? Why can't we be in this a friendship with Jesus like we're in friendship with most of our earthly friends? No one has to die. Why is it that someone has to die in this relationship? Well, Paul says in Romans, as you all may know, that the wages of sin is death. It's because of our sin. Our sin has made us enemies of God. That we have indeed merited the wrath of God. That there's a big chasm now that stands before a holy God and sinful creatures. We are separated. And this is something that the Old Testament saints would have known very well. The sacrificial system pointed them to their own sin, their own unworthiness. As we uh, consider in Hebrews uh, a while back, that the, the, the reminder of the sacrifice has served as a reminder to them of their own unworthiness and sinfulness. 
that they were not worthy in themselves to approach God even as he was representing the temple. So our sin has earned the full wrath of God. And if it's not for Jesus dying for us, we will die. Sin necessitates death. So it's as if you know, we are on the, the railroad tracks, as it were. That we are looking forward to the, the train of God's wrath coming down. But it's as if Jesus comes and unties us from those tracks and he lays down there and takes the full brunt of God's wrath uh, for us. He satisfies God's wrath. He takes the punishment for us that our sin has earned. Again, this is one of those things that we probably all are familiar with. We've heard a lot. We intellectually can assent to these things. But practically, it can be hard for us to really believe when we look at our own sin, our own hearts, that... God's wrath has really been satisfied for us. And we do have the law of God written on our hearts, and the law does accuse us. So we need to be constantly reminded of this truth. And this is why in our liturgies we have uh, a, a time where we hear the good news of the gospel, that God's wrath is no longer upon us, that we are forever beloved of God if we are looking to Christ by faith. As you can see, the foundation of this friendship is gracious. As Jesus himself chose us, and he chose us in order to die for us, to make us objects of God's love. Well, this foundation also comes with great privilege. This leads us to my second point, the privilege of friendship with Jesus. Look with me at, at verse 15. Jesus uh, tells us, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends, for all that I've heard from my Father I have made known to you. Well, Jesus has already referred to his disciples as, as servants, as slaves, in reference to uh, them suffering as he will suffer. He says a, a servant is not greater than his master. If I'm the master being persecuted, well, surely you as my servants should also expect persecution. And you also notice that the rest, of New the rest of the New Testament, especially the Apostle Paul, continues with this imagery of Christians being servants or slaves of Christ. In fact, he, he begins most of his epistles as he calls himself, you know, the Apostle Paul, a slave or servant of Christ. So you may be wondering, is Jesus overthrowing this here? How can he be calling them to, you know, in one instance a servant, the other instance not a servant? Well, he, let, he isn't overthrowing this concept of Christians being, being servants. Rather, he's adding to it. Essentially what he's saying is, you are more than servants. You are also friends. And servants in the ancient world, they, they received a lot of commands from their master but they didn't have the privilege of having the ear of their master. The master wouldn't share personal things with them. They only received commands. They only received duties. They only worked for their master. They weren't friends. They weren't people of privilege. Well, kids, you probably have had times in school where two of your friends were whispering secrets to one another, and they weren't telling you those secrets. And your initial thought or reaction to that was probably, I thought we were friends. Because basic to our idea of friendship is a heightened level of communication. You tell things to your friends that you do not say to strangers. Well, Jesus is telling us here that the Father has spoken to him. And now he is speaking uh, to his disciples. At this point in John's narrative, the disciples probably aren't making a whole lot of sense of Jesus' words and statements. The, the Spirit hasn't come. But once Pentecost comes and acts, you start to see that, that things start to click in the mind of the disciples. They begin to understand these words of, of Jesus. Listen to John chapter 16, verses 14 through 15. Jesus says, The Holy Spirit will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. It's a spirit who will take these words of Jesus 
and cause his people to understand them. In fact, as one commentator uh, has, has noted, that he's given, he gave the illustration of, of a diary with a log. You know, someone keeps their most intimate uh, thoughts and reflections. And we, as it were, are given access into Jesus' diary, the diary of the triune God, as it were. And the key to this diary, to the revelation of God, is faith. Faith is what unlocks the diary of Jesus' words. We may be wondering, well, what is the big deal? Of course we have the Bible. You know, this isn't anything new to most of us. Well, why is it a big deal that we have the scriptures, that we can read them, hear them preached? Well, again, to use the analogy of earthly friendship, I think we've all experienced the power of a timely word. Whether it's in, in marriage, whether it's on your sports team, or at, you know, uh, at school, at work. The power of timely word, you're discouraged and someone co- comes to you with a word of encouragement. Or in the church, maybe you've been blinded by sin and someone comes to you and gives you, you know, a word to wake you up out of, out of your blindness. We've all experienced the power of a timely word. This is why friends and having people in our lives is so important. Well, the Bible describes us as Christians as, as being citizens of heaven. Yet we are not in our homeland yet. We are like pilgrims, strangers passing through this foreign land. This foreign land has many uh, enemies who experience hardships and hostility. And so we are in need of many timely words as we are on this pilgrimage. There will be times when we feel weary and faint-hearted. We feel as if we are indeed walking through a desert. And the word comes to us, comes to us a cold canteen of refreshment. When we are blinded by the deceitfulness of sin, it's the word that comes to us, rebukes us, gives us eyes to see our sin and a heart of confession before God. When we're ignorant of the Lord's ways, it's the word that teaches us. When we need wisdom as to which way we should go in life, it's the word that gives us guidance. When we need words and emotions to describe what we're feeling. We see that the word, especially the Psalms, give us those words and emotions to express what's in our heart. So as you can see, it's a great privilege that we can be friends of Jesus. That he indeed would reveal himself to us and speak to us through his word. Well, this friendship with Jesus is not only just a a great privilege, but it also comes with a high calling. There are indeed certain expectations that Jesus has upon his friends. He calls them to a certain lifestyle. He tells us that this lifestyle should be marked by fruitfulness and confidence in prayer. So if you look with me at verse 16... Again, Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Notice especially what he says now. And appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. The Lord has appointed, called his friends to be fruitful. Now, growing up in Minnesota, my favorite time of the year was fall time. This was apple season. Uh, What many Minnesotans do in the fall is go to apple orchards. They get their apple cider. They pick apples to make pies and and crisps. And you go to these orchards, and there's apples that are just, you know, overflowing with with apples. The pickers can't keep up. Some are just falling down and getting wasted. And this is somewhat somewhat like the idea that Jesus is getting at, the imagery that Jesus is getting at. He wants his friends to be like these Minnesota apple trees where the pickers just can't keep up. There's so many apples that are coming off the branch. He wants us to have fruitful lives. We just, uh, and what you'll see at the beginning half of this chapter, which I alluded to before, uh, he has the same imagery of the vine and the branches. Just like an apple tree branch can't uh, grow any apples if it's not attached to the trunk, to the vine. So too, we need to be attached to Jesus. We need to be in relationship with Jesus if we want to have any fruit in our Christian lives. You may be wondering, well, what 
exactly is this fruitfulness that Jesus is calling us to? It seems quite broad. Uh, Indeed, it, it is an analogy. So what is he trying to call us to exactly? Well, he calls us to bear a particular kind of fruit. He calls us to bear the fruit of love. This is one of the main themes that we see in this chapter. In fact, in verses 12 through 14, you see that, you know, we're called to love as Christ loved us. So his example of self-sacrifice is that example that's meant to to lead us, to guide us. And the original disciples would have, when when they heard that they were to love as Christ loved them, they would have thought of John 13. What happened in John 13? Jesus washes his disciples' feet. Jesus, the master, does what is unthinkable in the ancient world. He gets down and actually washes the feet of his servants. Which would have been probably the greatest act of self-sacrifice these disciples had ever encountered. As you know, they will encounter another, even greater example of self-sacrifice as Jesus lays down his life on the cross. But this is the kind of love that Jesus is calling us to. A love that's not convenient, but rather a love that comes at great cost to us and to our own lives and convenience. And you'll see the, the repetition of this command to love. As I notice in, in verses 12 through 14, Paul, uh, Jesus refers repeatedly to the Christian life being a life of love. Again, he repeats this again in verse 17. Jesus wants us to know that our response to being friends with him needs to look needs to come with this this fruit of love. In fact, in John 17, Jesus says that the way that that believers will be known to this world is by their love. That's what's going to cause them to stand out. So Christians are called to bear the fruit of love. Well, again, that seems quite broad. Does Jesus get any more specific here? Well, yet he does. Notice in verse 16. He says specifically that that his disciples are to go and bear fruit. He gives them this command to go. In the original context, this would have looked like the disciples ultimately going out uh, and planting churches, preaching the gospel, converting uh, the Gentiles and the Jews that we see going on, which we see going on in the book of Acts. But how should we think of this call to go? We, of course, many of us here are, are not going to be pastors or church planters. We're not going to be doing what the apostles did. So how, how, how should we think of this command to go and bear the fruit of love? I think one way we can do this is by thinking about the different areas or spheres of life that the Lord has called us to. You know, many of us are married. Many of us have families. Many of us have, have workplaces or neighborhoods or in school. We interact with a lot of different people throughout the week and a lot of believers and unbelievers, we have a lot of places to bear the fruits of love. A lot of opportunity to go and bear the fruit of love. And this is what Jesus is calling us to. He's calling us to go into these different spheres and love those around us in a self-sacrificial way. There's yet one more aspect to this lifestyle or calling of a friend of Jesus. Not only are they called to bear fruit, but they also are called to be confident in prayer. Look with me at at the second half of verse 16. Jesus says, So that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you. If you're reading out of the, the ESV, it may seem as if this so that, this purpose clause, at the end of verse 16, is connected to bearing fruit. So we bear fruit in order that we might be confident in prayer. However, this phrase is actually connected back to the appointment. So it's not connected to bearing fruit. It's connected to the appointment. That Jesus has appointed his people to bear fruit and to be confident in prayer. So part of the life of a friend of Jesus involves praying him. In fact, Jesus is assuming that his people are going to pray. And you'll notice that this is not given to us as a command or an imperative. Rather, it's given to us an assurance, an encouragement. Jesus no doubt expects that his people will pray, but he wants them to pray with confidence, pray with assurance, 
that God indeed will hear them. And this is quite the statement, isn't it? So that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give to you. Whatever you ask. And I think a lot of Christians today forget those three little qualifying words, in my name. And as a result, some people can, can take these words and think that God should give them anything they want. Whether it's a big house or a nice car. But it's those three little words that qualify this promise. So what does it mean that, that to pray in Jesus' name? This isn't just a, a tradition that Christians do for the sake of doing it when we close our prayers in Jesus' name. Rather, praying in Jesus' name means that we pray according to his word. We pray according to his will. That's why it's so helpful to pray with the words of Scripture as much as we can. To structure our prayers according to the Lord's Prayer. Because the Lord's Prayer gives us categories for what we should be praying for. And this is how we pray in Jesus' name and how we can have confidence that we will indeed be heard by our Heavenly Father. So as you can see, this lifestyle is calling. It's a calling to be fruitful. It's also a calling to be confident, to be assured that your prayers are heard by our Heavenly Father. Well, brothers and sisters, as we may not be able to connect with our own earthly friends and families uh, for some time now as we are continuing in, in quarantine. Let us be encouraged that we will never be quarantined from our friendship with Jesus as he promises to abide with us forever. Let us pray.